Can everybody hear me? Cool. So this is both my remote and also my speaker notes. I'm not just like tweeting as I talk to you. I'm actually remembering what to say. Uh, hi, I'm Laurie. I'm the CTO of NPM. Uh, I just spent two months being the CEO of NPM, actually, because uh, Isaac, who is the actually famous NPM guy, the guy who invented NPM, uh, he's usually the CEO, but he had a baby, uh, so he went on paternity leave. Um, but he had a baby on April 1st, uh, and he hadn't told anybody that he, had, that he was expecting a baby prior to the baby actually being born. So on April 1st, he was like, I'm a father, and then he went away. And it took us a couple of weeks for us to persuade people that, no, really, it was a real baby. He was actually on paternity leave. This wasn't just a joke. Uh, and they really did leave me in charge, which was the thing that people found hardest to believe. Uh, so first, I want to calibrate what I'm talking about. Uh, so I want a show of hands. Uh, how many of you have heard of NPM? Uh, how many have used NPM? How many use NPM every week? How many use NPM every day? Okay. How many of you uh, have used more than NPM install? <laughs> uh, how many of you consider yourselves to be front-end developers? How many of you consider yourselves to be node developers? That was about what I was expecting. That breakdown there, that there's this huge chunk of NPM users who aren't really Node developers, that was a thing that we were not expecting at all, and it's become the default. Nearly everybody who uses NPM is not really a Node developer anymore. They've become a minority in their own community, which is really uh, interesting and strange to us, but uh, we are embracing it, as I'm going to talk about. So what am I talking about today? I'm talking about the NPM workflow. Uh, and I'm going to be walking around just because I can, basically. Uh, NPM is more than install. NPM is about removing friction at every stage of your project's lifestyle. It's about, I'm going to talk about every stage, but this is not a tutorial. This is more like a guide. It's more like a tour. So don't worry if you see a code example and you can't remember the details. You don't have to worry about taking notes. You can look this up later, and the slides are going to be online. Uh, I want you to focus on the big picture, like the set of stuff that you can do with NPM. And the biggest of big pictures is, why should you be using NPM in the first place? Obviously, if you want a library and the instructions of the library are use NPM install, and you're going to use NPM install, but why would you publish stuff to NPM yourself? And the answer is really simple but really deep, which is that if you want to share code, if you want to share a library with the whole world, or if you want to share code just within your company, or you want to just share it with one or two of your collaborators, NPM makes it really easy to share code. And it's surprising how just reducing the friction around sharing code has become an entire ecosystem's worth of stuff. The driving force behind NPM is modularity. Uh, and NPM also makes modularity a lot more easy than it used to be, so the two are sort of self-reinforcing. NPM makes modularity easy, so modularity becomes popular, so NPM becomes popular, so it goes back and forth. Uh, if you're in the node world and you're running microservices, you'll have chunks of logic shared between your microservices, so it's really great to have little encapsulated packages of code that you can share between those services. Uh, and in the front-end world, people tend to use the word components rather than modules, but it's basically the same principle. Uh, and creating components for React in particular and a bunch of other web frameworks uh, is a big driver of NPM usage these days. But packages don't have to be components. Packages can be entire applications. Uh, it can be a full Node-powered service or a rich web application that runs on a backend that isn't part of Node. Uh, and we think that's a good idea, and I'll discuss that later. But here's the core of the NPM workflow. It is as simple as this can get. Uh, you initialize your project, you install your dependencies, you run, you test, you run, you test, uh, and eventually you decide that it's good enough to show the world or you just get sick of working on it, uh, and you pull a new version, uh, and you publish your application to the registry, uh, and the registry triggers your, your production deploy in a tale as old as time, except that last step. Where the hell did that come from, right? Like, there's no deploy command. Um, except there is. As of two weeks ago, we released webhooks, which do let you uh, hook deploys into your NPM workflow, and I'm going to talk about that in the end. Uh, but let's get to that in the right order. And first, we have a ton of other stuff to cover, starting with the basics, starting with the, uh, the most basic, because NPM is growing really, really fast, and that means there's a lot of new users. This is how fast NPM is growing. Uh, 
about half of NPM users turned up in the last year. If you've been using NPM for more than 12 months, you're in the upper half of people who've ever used NPM. Uh, and we're doing like a billion downloads a, month, uh, a week these days, which is just a staggering amount of usage. So if you're new to NPM and you don't really feel like you know what you're doing, don't worry, because you have a lot of company. So let's start with the most basic. This is the architecture of NPM. On your computer, you have the NPM command. Uh, we call it the command line interface, or the CLI, because we have too many things called NPM. Uh, when you install a package, the CLI makes a request to the NPM registry, and the registry tells it about every version that exists in the universe, and then the CLI looks at all of those and decides, of all of the versions that exist, which is the best one, given the range that you've told it to use. Once the CLI decides what version it wants to use, it first checks the local cache that sits on your machine. So if you've ever downloaded that version of that package before, it doesn't download it again. It just saves you bandwidth and time and uses the one that's sitting on your computer. Uh, but if you've never seen that version before, it will go and download it from the registry, uh, which is a set of computers distributed all over the world. In fact, uh, the nearest set of registry servers uh, to here is in Frankfurt. Uh, so these are the fastest NPM installs I've ever done in my life, because it's like two milliseconds away right now. Uh, and all of our servers are cloud servers, so I think right now I'm standing closest to our production servers than I've ever stood before. Uh, the reason I mentioned that the registry exists and that that's where the downloads come from is because we asked people once where the registry comes from, and 20% of people didn't know the registry existed at all. Uh, they thought that the downloads came from GitHub, which is not true, and thank goodness, because a billion downloads a week from GitHub uh, would be quite a lot of load on GitHub and quite a lot of bandwidth from GitHub that nobody's paying for. Uh, so that's why we host the registry, and hosting the registry also lets us do a lot of other cool things, like hosting private packages. 95% um, of the packages on the registry, which now has something like 300,000 packages, uh, are open source. But if you have closed source code, uh, and you only want to share it with your team or only with the clients of your company, uh, NPM will allow you to do that within a feature called uh, organizations. They let you specify who can see your code in a really fine-grained way, uh, and you can host any number of packages for $7 per user per month, uh, which is how we afford all of that bandwidth that you're all using. If your company is really big or really paranoid, uh, you may be interested in NPM Enterprise, which is a private copy of the registry shrunk down and crammed into a couple of Docker containers that runs inside of your network, uh, and it lets you store private packages. It also lets you mirror the registry. Uh, you can mirror the whole registry, or you can filter the mirror so that it's uh, only running packages that you approve of by license or by security criteria or basically anything that you can think of, uh, and that costs about 2,000 bucks a year. So that's the architecture and also a plug for our paid products, because whatever, this is an enterprise con uh, con uh, conference. I can talk about paid stuff. Um, but one thing before we get started, which is you should update your copy of NPM. NPM is updated every single week, nearly every single week, uh, and it's currently in version 3, and yet the majority of people are running version 2. Even if you're running version 2, NPM 2 is also updated every week. Uh, so you can either run the first command to get the latest version of NPM 3 or the second command to get the latest version of NPM 2, and either of them will be much better than you're probably running right now. The next command that you should know is npm init. Uh, if you run npm init, it will start a new project for you. It will ask you a bunch of simple questions uh, about your project and then create a new package JSON for you without you having to copy and paste it or remember what all of those things should be. It has very smart defaults about what those answers should be. So if you're pretty sure that it's going to get it right, you can just run npm init with dash dash yes, and it will just create a package JSON for you without having to actually answer any questions at all. Uh, one of these things is one of the things that I'm going to say is that you should not really be editing your package JSON unless you absolutely have to. Most of the time, npm will do it for you, and it does it more accurately than you would do it yourself. Scopes are a relatively new npm feature. Uh, with nearly 300,000 packages in the registry now, it's hard to think of a name that isn't taken, and this is a big problem uh, about a year ago. Uh, so scopes let you fix that problem. Scopes let you publish packages underneath your username uh, or the name of your organization, which lets you use much more descriptive names, and it also lets you conveniently group packages together. These are all of the packages my company publishes. Uh, scoped packages work just like ordinary packages. You install them using the scope, you require them using the scope. Uh, private packages always use a scope, uh, but you can also public, publish scoped packages that are public. 
An advanced trick, if you have a really big team and they're publishing packages all the time, is you'll find that you probably have standards about what your packages should be like. You probably want everybody to test things the same way. You probably have some standards of how things should be started and stopped. You probably have some naming conventions about how your packages should be named. And if you have those, you can create a file called npm-init.js uh, and share it with your developers, and it can customize the way that npm init works. Uh, so you can set different defaults, so you can uh, change your package naming conventions, you can add or remove questions from that set of questions that npm init asks you. Uh, it's really very powerful, and the, the uh, package that helps you write those questions is called Promzard. One more thing about npm init is that it picks stuff up from the environment it's running in. So if you've already initialized a Git repo where you're about to start your package, when you run npm init, it will work that out, and it will put your Git repository into the repository field of package.json for you. If you've already started installing package, it will go, oh, there's already a node modules folder here. It will add the node modules uh, to your dependencies, because you know, they were there, so you were probably using them. And the other thing about npm init is that it can be safely rerun. So if you do those things later and you forget to run npm init, you can run npm init again, and it will pick those things up. npm init only ever adds stuff to package.json. It never blows things away, so it's always safe. So I said that you should never edit package.json. Uh, here's another way to avoid doing that. Uh, this is, again, in the category of really basic things that a huge chunk of NPM users don't know. When you run NPM install, if you run NPM install with dash dash save, or dash s for short, it will automatically update your package JSON and pa add that package to your dependencies. Uh, if, you add, if you use save dev or dash d, it will automatically add it to your dev dependencies. Why should you add stuff to your dev dependencies? Well, because there's a bunch of stuff that you use only when you're developing the tool and not using on production. So there's no reason to install like your testing framework on your production servers. So if you add your testing framework to your dev dependencies instead, your production installs will be faster and smaller. Another way to make your production installs faster uh, is to use bundle dependencies. If you set a package as a bundle dependency, it will be included in the package file rather than being downloaded separately. So if you bundle all of your dependencies, deploying your application becomes downloading a single file and unpacking that onto the server, which is a lot faster, especially if you have thousands of dependencies. Uh, NPM itself bundles all of its dependencies for that reason. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when NPM installs, it checks the server for the current list of versions, even if you already have it in your local cache. This means that it always needs to check the network. It's not checking the network to download the package. It's checking the network to make sure there's no newer version of the package that it should download. Uh, that extra check can be really annoying if you're in a low bandwidth environment like airplane Wi-Fi or the nation of Australia. Uh, so there's a setting that will help there, which is cache min. Cache min controls how long NPM waits before it hits the network ad again to see if a newer version of a package is available. So for some reason, the default is 10 seconds, which is not a very smart default at all. There's two ways to use this settings. If you use it at install time with a very high number, like the first command, uh, basically you'll be performing an offline install. NPM will install everything from the local cached copies unless it absolutely can't find that package, and only then will it hit the network. The other way to use it is uh, to permanently set your cache min to 60 seconds, which is a much like a very slightly larger number that will make your installs faster. It means that within you know 60 seconds of running a single install, it won't check five times to uh, check if the same package has been updated within an install, which is what it does right now, which is really dumb. Uh, but npm is more than just a way to manage dependencies. Uh, it's also a way to automate that the, way, the way that your team works with each other. One of the things that npm tries to do is it tries to reduce the amount of friction and the amount of communication that your team has to, has to do to make its job uh, happen. Uh, and one of the simplest ways that we can do that is npm scripts or run scripts. You can add these to the scripts section of your package.json. Uh, unfortunately, there's no automatic way of doing that. Uh, and then you and your team can use them to start or stop or restart or test uh, to save you having to remember the command to do those things. You no longer have to have a wiki page that says, to start the server, run server.js slash you know, port whatever. You just put that into your package JSON and never remember it again. Uh, NPM test is also used by CI systems like Travis CI uh, to run your tests without needing to know what framework you're using. One really useful feature of run scripts uh, is that the tools that you put into your dev dependencies are automatically available in the path. So if you have grunt or gulp 
uh, or TAP or Mocha in your dev dependencies, you can refer to them directly in your run scripts without having to uh, install them globally separately or worry that maybe two different versions of two different uh, projects have installed different versions of Grunt and Gulp and are fighting about that, which is a pretty common problem. So now you've got an app or a module. Uh, you can test it. You can run it. You'll want to publish it. If it's a package that you want the world to use, you can use a global name uh, and just npm publish it. Uh, but if it's for your team or you're for your personal app, uh, you'll probably want to publish it under a scope, and you probably want to make it a private package. Of course, all of this covers just the very first version of your application. Uh, but the power of NPM comes from the way that it handles multiple versions. And the root of that is semantic versioning, or SEMVR. Semantic versioning at heart is really simple. It is a contract between the creator of a package and the users of that package that says, this is how big a change I am making right now. So the first number in the SEMVR is uh, called the major number is for breaking changes. That's for stuff that requires you to change your code to be able to use it. The second number called the minor is for feature changes. That means that I've added some functionality, but you don't need to change your code and nothing will break. Uh, and the th last number called the patch is for bug and security fixes, uh, which means that this fix should correct bugs, but you don't need to change any code, and you should not expect anything to change. That's all it's doing. All it's doing is it's saying down in the version number a thing that you might otherwise have put in a release note or otherwise had to send somebody an email about or had to tell them about. This is what this change does. It's just built into the versioning. And we sometimes say that NPM is a bet on the utility of SEMVR. Uh, and a big part of what NPM ma makes NPM useful is, is SEMVR. SEMVR reduces uncertainty. It reduces the amount of thinking that you have to do, the amount of talking and reading uh, about what versions are safe to use. If everyone uses SEMVR properly, then everyone's code is more secure, it's more featureful, and it's more stable. And NPM reduces the friction around versioning. So when you change your package, you should always version it. Uh, the version is part of package.json, so like most things, NPM has a way to change package.json for you. If you use the NPM version command, NPM version major will do breaking changes, minor will do uh, feature changes, and patch will do, fi will do fix changes. Version supports a bunch of other sort of smaller, weirder edge cases for versioning uh, that I'm not going to talk about now. But of course, SEMVR is a promise. It's not a guarantee. Uh, SEMVR works if everyone uses it properly, but not, out every, not everyone always uses it probably, properly, and sometimes people use it incorrectly by accident. Sometimes uh, fixes do cause stuff to break. Sometimes adding a new feature causes stuff to go wrong. That shouldn't happen, but it does. So what is a responsible NPM developer supposed to do if you're relying on SEMVR, but SEMVR cannot always be relied on in a big, uh, wide world of 300,000 packages? So there's a couple solutions. One of them is NPM shrinkwrap. Shrinkwrap was invented to solve this problem, and it captures your entire dependency tree at a time that you know that it's working. It goes all the way down through your tree, all the dependencies and all of their dependencies all the way down, uh, and it saves them to a shrinkwrap.json file. And then when you install it, it installs the exact versions that you had running at the time that you ran shrinkwrap. Uh, the problem with shrinkwrap is that it's kind of buggy. Uh, we are working on that, and it's one of the things that we intend to put a lot of effort to in the next year. But in the meantime, there are other projects like Clingwrap, uh, which sort of paper over the holes in what Shrinkwrap is doing. Uh, and you can also use bundle dependencies to uh, capture the exact dependencies that were there when you were running the uh, when you were running bundling. But all of this so far has been assuming that there's just one of you. One of you is writing the package. One of you is publishing the package. Uh, but in reality, you work in a team. You want other people in your company to be able to use your package. You want some of them to be able to publish it. You want some others to be able to install it. Those are not necessarily the same people. Uh, this is especially important when you're working with private packages. And we call this feature organizations. Uh, to use organizations, we added two new commands to NPM, team and access. They give you access to packages in a really granular way. Uh, like I mentioned, NPM organizations are a paid feature. So I apologize for this being a little bit of a plug. Uh, but again, enterprise conference, what the hell. The team command is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you can create and destroy a team. You can add people to the team, and you can remove them from the team again. And you can see who's in a team. That was louder than I expected. Uh, NPM access is similarly pretty simple. Access grant gives a team read-only or read-write or read -write access to a package. Access revoke takes that permission away again. Access ls packages shows you what packages a user or a team can see. Uh, and access ls collaborators sort of goes the other way and says, given this package, who has access to it? So now that we've done that, let's level up again. 
uh, we went from one user with one package to multiple users with one package, so now it's time for multiple packages. Uh, imagine that you've split your code up uh, as a front-end developer into a bunch of separate components, but you need to be able to work on the whole look of the website all at the same time. It would be super annoying if every time you changed one component, you had to publish that little micro change and then install it down into somewhere else and use that that way. Luckily, we fixed that problem, uh, and the way to fix that problem is Link. Uh, here's how NPM Link works. In the root of, your package you run, of the package you want to link, you run NPM Link. And then you go to this package where you want to use that other package, and you run npm link that name. Now those two packages are linked. You can edit the code in either one, and it will be immediately available to each other. Uh, if you have lots of small modules, this is invaluable. This is how npm works on npm, because npm itself is made up of dozens of modules, and the code is all over the place. So we can't just be constantly publishing little tiny subcomponents of npm. So cool. We've got multiple users. We've got multiple packages. Uh, let's level up again. We've got multiple releases. If you have a big team, you're going to find this valuable because you'll want to have a stable version that's definitely working, and then you'll want to have a sort of work-in-progress version or a next release version that everybody wants to work on. Uh, you could, of course, just tell everybody, you know, version 1.7 is the stable version, 1.9 is the release version, uh, sorry, is the beta version, but that's a pain in the ass, and NPM wants to take away pains in your ass. So you can use dist tags, which are also called release tags. You can apply a dist tag at publish time uh, using dash dash tag when you publish. Uh, this actually happens by default every time you publish. By default, every new publish is tagged as the word latest. And when you in just run npm install with no other arguments, what you're really doing is you're running npm install package at latest. Uh, but you can also run npm install package at beta or package at LTS. So what happens if you published a version as beta and you now want it to become latest? Well, that's what the dist tag command lets you do. This tag add applies the given tag uh, to the given version. So only one version at, at a time can have a tag. So if you add a tag to a new version, it's like you've moved it from one version to the, to the next. Uh, you can remove the tag entirely with RM. You can see what tags exist with LS. Uh, big packages like Babel that consist of hundreds of packages, they tend to release everything on a next tag slowly as they become available and they pass their tests. And then when everything is ready, they move all of the 100 packages over to the latest tag all at the same time. One other way that you can use tags is within your team. Uh, if you run npm install with dash dash tag, npm will prefer versions that have that tag. So if everyone in your team is working on a next version and you don't want to have to, everyone to share which version is next, you can just run npm install dash dash next, and you will get within your package all of the subcomponents that other people are working on that are currently uh, pushed to your next branch. Of course, sometimes you make a mistake, uh, and you publish a version by accident, or the version has a bug that's going to take a while to fix, and you just want that version to be gone. Uh, NPM Unpublish lets you do that. But as you may have heard recently, uh, unpublishing a package can cause trouble if a bunch of people are depending on that package when you take it away. Uh, so recently, we made a change uh, that if you publish something, you can unpublish it for 24 hours with no fuss. After 24 hours, if you still want to unpublish it, you can contact support at npmjs.com, and they will help you work through the process of unpublishing or work out what went wrong. Uh, and also, we don't give package names away to corporations anymore, because that turned out to be a bad idea. Uh, if you've got a package that you don't want people to use anymore, but a lot of people are still using it, uh, a much safer option is to use npm deprecate. People will still be able to install the package, but they will get a message whenever they do. Uh, this is easier and friendlier and doesn't you know, break everybody. Uh, after you've been running a project a while, you'll find that some of your dependencies have been updated, uh, but they'll be breaking changes, so they won't automatically get pulled in by Semver, and you'll want to know about them anyway. So how do you find those? The command to do that is npm outdated. NPM, npm outdated will give you a list of all of your dependencies that looks like this. Uh, the current column shows you what you have. The wanted column shows you the highest version that your current Semver range will allow. And the latest shows if there's a version that is higher than that. So if there's a breaking change, it will show up in that column. A little while back, I mentioned npm start, stop, and test. And I called them npm run scripts. Uh, here's why I did that. Uh, in the script stanza of your package JSON, you can define any scripts at all. And then you can uh, get them to run using the npm run command. Uh, like start, stop, and test, they have all the same features. They get the dev dependencies uh, in their path, and you can use them for all sorts of things like these people did here. I, this was the most complicated set of NPM run scripts I've ever seen in my life. I was so impressed. Um, 
People use it to set up their environment. The first time they use it to clean stuff up, they use it to change packages, they use it to you know, tear up and set down databases. Uh, but basically, any common task that your developers need to do, you can just throw it into your run scripts, and then you don't have to be pasting command lines back and forth. Run scripts get another useful feature for free, which is a bunch of NPM variables. Every key in package.json is available as an NPM package value, and every configuration value used by NPM is available as an NPM config value. Even more usefully, if you create a config key in your package.json, you can put default values in there, and they will be overridden by NPM config values. So as you can see in this example, I set a default port uh, for my application to run on, uh, and a user can use the NPM config command to set the port that they want to run without having to mess with a config file anywhere. The final and most useful feature of NPM scripts that I'm going to mention is lifecycle hooks. Certain names for run scripts are special. Uh, and they will run automatically in response to certain events. So uh, when you publish your package or you're running the version command or you're installing your package for the first time, these scripts will execute. And you can use this to automate all sorts of things. Uh, lots of package authors use it to uh, compile binary extensions, which have to be, install which have to be run compiled on the machine that you're installing on. Um, but one of the fun things about it is you can force the event to fail if the script fails. So one of the things that we do is we have a, uh, a pre-publish event that runs our tests. So it's impossible to publish a version of our code that fails its tests because it literally won't run. It just you know it runs the tests and then it fails. Uh, and this is a really great low friction way of ensuring best practices and standards across your team. You don't have to like have a checklist that everybody reads and remembers to follow. You can just build it into the package JSON. Uh, and the very last feature of NPM that new people are sometimes unaware of but is super useful is the NPMRC file, or more accurately, the NPMRC files, because they're uh, They save you, NPMRC, NPM has more than 100 configuration commands, uh, so being able to write them down and store them in a the file is a very useful thing. Uh, if you put an NPMRC in your package root, that is a good place to put per project settings that are shared across your entire team, but you can also have one just for your, users, uh, just for your user uh, in your home directory. The other thing that NPMRC does is that it holds your authentication token. Uh, you can use this token to authenticate other services to NPM, and the tokens can be individually viewed and revoked on the NPM website. Uh, a really common use case for this is for private packages on CI services. Uh, you don't want to put your username and password, and you don't want to put your authentication into your files in your package. You want them to be in some kind of uh, easily revocable form. So uh, using this pattern is how you can do that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the full details, but Remy's post is really great and explains exactly how that works. So remember the workflow that we covered at the beginning? We have covered init, install, run, version, and publish. And now there's the new thing that you can do with NPM, which is deploys. But first, I need to introduce a new CLI. Uh, this tool is called Wombat. If you are familiar with Chrome Canary, this is kind of like that. It's uh, where we're putting the new sort of experimental features that we're not sure that we want to support forever. Uh, it's very small, and it only does a couple of things right now. But one of the things that it does is it lets you control NPM's webhooks. Webhooks are callbacks. They're callbacks that you register that will fire in response to events that happen in the registry, events like a package publish or an update or changing a disk tag or starring a package, because obviously everybody's constantly starring stuff on NPM. That's definitely a feature that we are happy about and everyone uses. Um, like organizations, uh, webhooks are a paid feature, uh, but have I mentioned how affordable we are? Um, so this is the command that will add a new hook. Uh, this will listen for changes on myco slash package, uh, and when, every, when anything happens, it will call myco slash my hook with a JSON payload containing the details of what happened and which package it was. Uh, it will include the secret that you specified so that nobody else can call that hook and spoof an event. At the moment, you can hook into three things. Like I just showed, you can follow a specific package. You can also follow unscoped packages. You can follow everything that happens in your organization, which is quite useful because it lets you follow when new packages happen. Uh, and you can follow everything that a specific user does. If what you've always wanted to do is, is, is you know, just use whatever package Substack has published today, this is how you can hook into that. Uh, Wombat has a few other hook commands. Uh, LS will let you see the hooks. Update will let you change them. RM will let you delete them. So how do you use a webhook to deploy? You set up a listener in production. When you publish a new package, uh, or when a package disk tag changes to production, your listener can redeploy and restart. 
uh, and we created a package called npm hook receiver, which makes that really easy to do. As you can see, npm hook receiver uh, makes the code necessary to run a hook listener extremely small. Uh, this is a complete listener. This is all that needs, all you need to write. Uh, you respond to the event uh, of a publish by running an install or doing a restart or whatever it is that you do. So that's what webhooks are, and you can use, and uh, that's how you use them to deploy. But why would you use them to deploy? Uh, my answer is why not use them to deploy? Uh, there are a thousand ways to deploy things. Like it's not like before npm invented a way to deploy things. Everyone was like, oh, we've written all this code and we can't get it out into the world. Deployment is impossible. Um, but uh, maybe you don't use GitHub, so you don't have access to their webhooks. Maybe the people who, public, who can commit to stuff on GitHub are not the same as the people who can publish the package, and you want that deployment to be linked to them. Uh, maybe you just find it easier to do it this way or more sensible to do it this way. Who knows? Webhooks have only existed for two weeks. You tell us uh, why you find this better. But webhooks enable far more than just deployment automation. Hooks let you remove manual steps uh, when you publish a new component. When you publish a new component, do you have to tell somebody about it? Do you maybe send an email, or do you post into Slack that it's happened? Or when there's a new thing that, you know, a new package that has been updated, do you have to tell everybody, oh, update your dependencies? There's no reason that you should be doing that manually. We'd like you to automate that, and Hooks let you do that. Uh, maybe you need to trigger some other process. Maybe you need to tell the security person to review your package. Uh, maybe you need to tell a customer that they have to install this new thing. Uh, Hooks let you build the features that you wish NPM had, and then you can build them and say, why doesn't NPM have this feature? And we'll be like, sure, OK, we'll throw that in there. We are very excited about the value that Hooks will unlock for everybody who uses NPM. Before I wrap up, uh, I wanted to cover a few more things, uh, because there are a handful of tools that have become essential to the way modern JavaScript is developed that aren't part of NPM, but everybody who uses NPM seems to use them, so it's worth talking about them. The first is Babel, which I mentioned very briefly earlier. Babel is a transpiler. It's a tool that transforms next version JavaScript into JavaScript that you can run right now, uh, either in Node or in your browser. Uh, it also transpiles stuff that isn't JavaScript. Lots of projects and tutorials these days just sort of assume that you know what transpilation is and that you're already transpiling your code. So they just use bits of JavaScript that don't actually exist yet. Uh, and newbies find this very confusing, so this is why I mentioned Babel. When you see JavaScript that isn't really JavaScript, this is what they're doing. They're transpiling it with Babel, and you should learn how to do that. Uh, another thing lots of people do uh, and assume that you know how to do already is make your node code and your modules work in a browser. Uh, there are two popular ways to do that. The first is Browserify, uh, and the second is Webpack, which is a sort of newer, more batteries-included version of Browserify. Uh, Basically, they're both very spe specific types of transpiler that take uh, server-side code and make it web code. Another tool that we at NPM are finding super useful is Greenkeeper. Greenkeeper is like NPM outdated as a service. Uh, it constantly checks for updates to all of the packages that you depend on, uh, and it notifies you when those packages have changed. Uh, and then it runs your tests on them to find out whether or not that update is going to break your build or not. If, your update isn't going to, if the update isn't going to break your build, it's like, everything is cool. And if it does, it's like, everything is crazy. Don't deploy right now, which is a very useful service to receive, an email every so often that goes, if you deploy right now, everything will break. That is a, that is a service that I find useful and I will pay for. Uh, so we've turned it on for most of our repos. Uh, and the last one that I want to mention is the Node Security Project. They make a really great tool called NSP. Uh, which consults a big database in the cloud of all the known vulnerabilities, uh, and it will alert you if you're using a vulnerable mo module. Uh, it will hook, hooking uh, a check for NSP into a pre-published lifecycle event is a really great way of making sure that you never publish a module that has an, uh, a vulnerability in it. So, a quick recap. Here is all the stuff that I just talked about. Uh, I'm hoping that you found at least one thing in this list that you'd never seen before, whether you're a node dev or a front-end dev, whether you're an experienced user or a newbie. But there is a broader picture here that I'm trying to get at. Uh, NPM, like I've mentioned a bunch of times, it's always been about reducing friction. Whatever it was that you were trying to do, we'll throw that in there, uh, and we will make it easy to do that thing. And that's what we're trying to do now. 
uh, because the web is coming to NPM. In fact, coming is not the word. The web came to NPM. All of the front-end developers in the world just turned up one day and were like, we're here now, and it's really hard to build websites. What the hell is wrong with you? And we were like, we thought this was a node tool, but it's not. It's not anymore. You all raise your hands. This is a front-end developer's tool, and it's a front-end developer's tool that was built expecting to be something else. And that is a problem for us, and it's a problem for you, and it's a problem that we're trying to fix. Uh, we think something like 80% of NPM users are just NPM users, not Node users. They're just front-end developers. Uh, but it's very hard to pin down that number exactly. Uh, and there's just, you know, the, the wave is unstoppable. NPM is the de facto or sometimes the official registry for uh, not just for Node, but for jQuery, for Grunt, for Gulp, for Ionic, for Cordova, uh, for Nodebots, for Babel, for Atom. Uh, as of yesterday, we are the official registry for TypeScript 2. Um, for Angular, for Ember, for React, and for like several thousand web frameworks so that I don't have time to list right now, millions of websites are deployed via NPM, and we know that because we can see them hitting the registry every time they do it. Uh, and all of that growth is coming from web devs like you. You are the NPM community. Uh, you don't need to be a Node developer to have a stake in NPM. You don't need to be apologetic about the fact that you don't know about Node or you don't care about Node. This is your tool. Even if you just started using NPM, this is your community. So what can we do for you? Hooks were the first step that we took. We saw a hole in your workflow, and we tried to fix it for you. Uh, but what can we do to make your life easier? Don't be shy. This is a thing that we want to fix for you. And we have one thing that we want you to do, which is we want you to start publishing your apps to NPM, not just your modules, not just your components, not just your libraries, but the whole app. Uh, once you do that, we can start doing much more interesting things. We can tell you if your application is insecure. We can tell you when people need to update your depths. We can tell you, we can analyze your code for problems. Uh, we can put your application in context across the whole registry. If you're using Module X, we can say, well, people don't seem to be using Module X anymore. Everybody seems to have switched to Module Y. You should probably look at that. If you're using Framework Z, we can give you a list of all of the components that use, people use with Framework Z and tell you which one is the most popular. Uh, and this is not just theoretical. Right now, we are working with some partner companies and building the first registry add-ons uh, for security, for licensing, and for code quality. Uh, initially, these will be for NPM Enterprise, but they'll be coming to the full registry, and we expect to be able to announce the first of these soon. The world of web development is coming to NPM, and we intend to make you feel right at home. Uh, because making websites is too damn hard, and it seems to be getting harder every day. Uh, and we hate that, and we're here to make it easier. It's our mission and our promise, and we hope that, we'll, that you will join us. Thank you.